Welcome to Sluggo, episode number one. Uno. <laughs> How you doing there, Marty? Doing great, Casey. What's happening tonight? Just another beautiful day up here in the Northeast, reading, thinking about this college football season. It's on the horizon. Students and players are getting back to campus. It just seems like there's some positive flow into the way of the uh, college football season maybe you know we're, we're still there's still that unknown going on but it just this momentum keeps building I know we we talked a while back you and me personally and we had we had averages on it on on whether or not we thought right. the season was going to happen and here we are I mean, it's, it's, teams it's are arriving there. on campus yeah it's getting there it's taking a while and there's still some uncertainty of course um, and it seems like, you know, you could drive yourself totally, absolutely bonkers reading the news um, and the different stories. And sometimes the same person says two or three different things, right? We're, we're going to, you know, there's going to be a second wave. No, it's going to be okay. We're going to be able to have football and baseball starting. It's just, you can drive yourself absolutely nuts reading all the news. I know you have some news for us. But you can drive yourself nuts trying to figure out when things are going to start, whether it's MLB or the NBA or, or the NFL, for that matter. So I'm just kind of sitting back, operating under the assumption that at some point we're going to have college football this season. And that, that is what we want to do here. We want to talk mostly college football. We will go off a little bit on some of these other sports, but you brought up a great point there with, with the other sports. Uh, hockey's starting, they're rumbling that they're going to start mid-July. NBA's talking they may be in Orlando. I watched a boxing match last night at, out of uh, Las Vegas. Um, were there fans? UFC, no, were there? there was not, no. Okay. Which, which it, it gives a different element. But on that topic, I will delve into our show here. We have many different topics we're going to discuss throughout the show. Like I said, this is our first episode of Sluggo, the new podcast about college football. That was it. College football, what we're all waiting for. Yeah. But anyway, COVID-19 is obviously the topic that has taken over the world. Um, I now live and work at the same place. Not necessarily sleep because I'm in the basement, but I live and work out of the same place. And that's weird. But college football, like I said there in my short little open, they, the, the, the football teams are going back to campus. Clemson started today, Monday, the 8th. What day are we on? See, I don't even know what day we're at. We're on Wednesday <laughs> the 10th, Casey. <laughs> uh, other schools are either showing up this week, next week, have already been there from June 1st. Once they were given the go-ahead, it's voluntary, quote-unquote voluntary, for them to be there. I, I, from everything that I'm reading, 98% of the teams or players are back to campus. Uh, but one thing that is sticking out since players have gone back to campus, whether it's this week, last week, is that there are teams that are players on teams around the country that are testing positive for COVID. That's not a good thing because – as we saw with, with uh, basketball, one player shut the whole season down. Well, one player shut the whole season down when this was more of an unknown. And I hate to say it's, it's not like it's not an unknown now. I think we still don't know everything, obviously, about the virus. But it's more of a known now, right? It's, it's young people are, have a tendency to recover more than people of my age or perhaps your age. But... I don't think, and I don't think it's actually as deadly, easy for me to say, um, as initially thought or as uh, dangerous as initially thought. Now, I am not a doctor and I don't pretend to be. Um, I'm just saying it seems that now testing positive these days is not the same as it was in March or even April for that matter, especially if you're a 23 or 20 year old um, uh, athlete in, in, in good shape, obviously you don't want to get the virus at any age, but if you have to, 
if you're 20 years old and in great shape, great physical condition, great nutrition, the chances are high that you're going to recover from it. I think the questions for me are, what's the protocol when somebody on the team does test positive? And secondly, this could be a really, really crazy year in college football. I mean, think about this. Thursday morning, Clemson playing Notre Dame on Saturday, and Trevor Lawrence tests positive. And Trevor's been in the meeting with Travis Etienne. And instead of seeing those two on the field, are you going to see DJU, as I'm going to call him throughout the year, <laughs> <laughs> and Lynn J. Dixon, for example? Now, Clemson's in a lot better shape than a lot of teams, but it really could wreak havoc during the season. And I'm again, I'm going on the assumption that's obviously seriously serious for the young men who test positive, and, and it's going to happen. I, I really believe that for not necessarily those two guys, but somebody on the Clemson team. It's going to happen, but the question is um, which teams are better prepared when it does happen, for me anyway. It's going to give new meaning to the injury report, isn't it? You know, it's, it's going to be one of those things where you never – you won't know until game time. And like you said, what is the protocol going forward? Are they going to get, have to get tested before each game? It brings, it brings more money into play too, but that's another topic for another day. But the big name that, that was tested positive this week was uh, Oklahoma State. Their All-American linebacker, who I cannot pronounce his last name, but his first name is Amen, Og, Ogbog Bimija. He tested positive for COVID-19. And he came out and said he's doing fine. He's quarantining for 14 days. He's going to stay out of uh, anybody's way, kind of hunker down, if you will. I hate that, that stay-at-home kind of order. But that's what he's going to be doing. There's three at University of Central Florida, one at Florida State, three at Al uh, five at Alabama, three at Auburn. And that's just the beginning. We don't know any of these others. Notre Dame tested 80. They're waiting for seven tests back. Florida's got similar numbers that way. We're just going to – that's going to be the news cycle here for college football in the next three weeks. And is that, is that a, quote, strategy? I'm not saying anybody's doing this on purpose, but what about everybody or whoever's going to catch it, catch it in July, quarantine for three weeks or whatever, whatever the time frame is, and then be over it, right? Have the antibodies and be ready to roll come August and September. Um, just all kind of weird things are going to happen. This could be a year to go to Vegas and say, put, you know, put a large no amount of money on some random team that, you know, probably would finish in the top 20, maybe somebody like Northwestern, that's not a top 20, but, but somebody like Northwestern who, um, uh, I don't know, is probably, probably, uh, got more medical education than your average college football player and uh, can figure out how to work this whole system to their advantage. Yeah. Uh, why not? Let's go out to Vegas, you know, That's Vegas cool. is reopened. That's let's, what go I've out seen. To, let's go out to Vegas and put money on Northwestern. That's not going to be my first, <laughs> <laughs> my first take on, uh, on Sluggo. Hey, now, Marty, we did want to be we did want to be bold with some of our takes. You know, be the hottest of all hot takes. That's the that's the first one. I'm writing it down. I don't know. Bold versus stupid. Hmm. The fine line there. The fine line between bold Very. and stupid. You know, Very my up. thoughts a little bit a little bit more serious. My thoughts really on the COVID thing as we turn the page and we kind of believe that college football is going to happen in some sort of semblance, some sort of way, some fashion. Are they going to have 12 games or eight or nine or only conference games or what are they going to do? I guess my question is really bigger picture in that will college football ever be the same, right? Because college football, in my mind anyway, separates itself by the uniqueness of the sport and the traditions. We're talking about tailgating and going back to campus and seeing the guys you failed out of school with and had to spend some spend time in summer school with and thousands of people in huge stadiums, right? Often larger than NFL stadiums, especially in the South. Um, and all the traditions that make college football what it is and, and not, you know, the, the urgency to win, because if you lose one game, you may not make the playoffs. Right. Um, 
for instance, Clemson this year with their schedule. They may not make the playoff if they lose a single game. So there's something there every Saturday. And I'm concerned that it will never be the same, even if they let 20 or 30 or 40,000 fans in it. Could you imagine what would the dis, what would it be like last year at a Clemson game with 40,000 fans there? And in some ways, that's good, right? There'd be less traffic and less this and less that. But the money, as you spoke about earlier, is gone, right? They, there's no way they can have the same level program with half the money or less. And, Beef, who gets those 40,000 tickets? Is it the big donors? It's not, you know, the students? What are we going to, how's that all going to work out? But really, for me, it's about, is it going to be the same? And when, uh, when Trevor Lawrence throws a pass to Justin Ross and he makes a one-handed grab on the sidelines against Notre Dame and nobody's there to cheer. What's that going to be like? And how is that going to play out on TV? Is it going to look like spring game, right? Well, at least the spring game has the lower ball filled, you know. At, at Clemson, anyway, I've seen Alabama on their A day absolutely loaded and jammed. But you bring up a great point there. You know, like I said, I watched boxing yesterday. That's a different sport than what college football is. Do, do, do fighters feed off the fans? Absolutely. They sure do. But college football absolutely feels um, plays off their fans. Uh, think about Death Valley in LSU, the other Death Valley. Empty? Does that still have the same lore that it does on a Saturday night in Baton Rouge? If it's going to be empty? Do they have the same home field advantage, right? I mean, I, you know, there's, there's something, and that's a, something that we can talk about as we get on moving through the, the season, especially if this happens where, where they, we do have half empty stadiums or half right. full stadiums. I should be right to the positive. I should be a positive guy. Half, half full, glass half full, stadium half full. Stadium anyway. half full. <laughs> yeah. um, but does it make a difference? Does it really make a difference in the long run? Maybe some places it doesn't. Some places it absolutely does. And will the players, will it be the same for the players, right? Um, a lot of them want to play in front of 80,000 fans, and they thrive off that, as you just mentioned. Will it be the same? Will the intensity be the same, or will the intensity for the players be spring game-ish? I mean, think about this. Clemson and Wake Forest in an empty stadium? I mean, what is that? If they were playing at Wake, it would be normal, but. <laughs> or Miami. <laughs> Shots fired, Wake Forest fans. Yeah, I, I just wonder if it's going to be the same. It's kind of the great unknown for me. And I just, uh, again, I, you know, it's funny that we're, we're relaying this. We're talking about this in college football um, terms, but I'm thinking about even life, right? My job. Sometimes I work in an office. Sometimes I work from this desk right here. Sometimes I work at a vendor's office, a part uh, uh, a company that we contract with, right? So I'm all over the place. Now, the office building that I work in when I do go in has 2,000 people in it and public bathrooms and cafeterias and, you know, all those things. I don't think it'll ever be the same for me at work, much less in a football stadium. So I don't know that life will ever be the same fully. So it's going to be an interesting fall. And, and again, I'm not, all, I'm not saying it's bad, man. I'm working – it's all bad, I should say, because I'm working on the same tank of gas from March the 20th right now. <laughs> I'm going on my third month on the same tank of gas. Mm -hmm. Of course, they do this, you know, pandemic thing when gas prices are at the all-time lows too, right? You know, not, maybe not all-time lows, but low as it's been in a long time. Supply and demand, my friend. Supply no and doubt. demand. Well, you brought up a great point, too, about tailgating and, and bringing in people to these towns. I know one thing, and we do equate a lot of our experiences with Clemson. Both Marty and I went to Clemson, but we're not going to be Clemson-centric here. Um, but a lot of my experiences are going to come from Clemson, so I'm going to tell this story. A lot, my, when I lived in Greenville, South Carolina, not too long ago, it was an event. We had people coming from Savannah, from Charleston, from Charlotte, from New Jersey from all over the country. I had a friend come from Arizona for a weekend. It's an event. It's all day. If the game starts at 8 o'clock at night, we're usually there 
back in the day when we were doing it big, we'd be there at eight o'clock in the morning. Now that we're a little older and a little bit more responsible, we're there maybe at 10, 1030. <laughs> I had this one friend who, who wants to be there, be the first car in the parking lot. And most of the time he is. So, um, you know, it, it is an all day thing. Sometimes those people that come into town don't have tickets to the game. And we're just one car out of how many hundreds of thousands of cars or thousands of cars I probably should say that are that are coming into small town Clemson on a weekend so yes you say 20,000 people are allowed in the stadium you don't think 250,000 or let's let's maybe not go over the top there maybe 150,000 people aren't coming into Clemson on a Saturday absolutely and how, how, how are they going to police that nope and sorry you can't come in yeah and those businesses that rely on uh, on those fans, the ones that don't to go to the game, they go to the Esso Club and watch the game on the big screen and yeah. spend $150 on beer and food and, and whatever else you can get at the Esso Club, uh, you know, or Tiger Town or wherever. All those businesses around that are selling hats and shirts and jerseys and all that kind of stuff, I just continue. I, 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 I'm interested to see how it all works out. Um, I don't know that it's going to be good um, or the same, I should say. It might be the new normal, though I hate that. And I hate speculating because, as we've seen, it's gone wildly crazy since March. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, much less in September, October, November, and December. You know, I've heard there's everything, colleges are doing everything from totally online classes and we're not going back to campus to we're going back early. <laughs> we're going to beat, we're going to beat, you know, we're going to beat the, uh, the second wave and be out of here by, you know, the second week in November or whatever. So it's all over the place and it's never been a time like this, you know, that I can remember. And, you know, we both, I've got a 13 year old, almost 14 year old. I know you've got a young son and some, some steps and it is an interesting time to be a parent. I mean, my son came home from, uh, came home for spring break on March the 13th, I believe. And he hasn't been back to school since in the classroom setting. So just a crazy time to be a parent. Hey, Casey, I got a question for you. I know yes, you're, from, you're from New Jersey. You obviously spent some time in Clemson and, and uh, we'll get into this later, but folks, Casey actually sold season tickets for the Tampa Bay <laughs> Rays. And he's the guy that sold the season tickets that were sold that year, whatever year that was. And he's got a great story about Tony Dungy that he'll get into at some point. But I know you spent some time in the South. Do you like barbecue? Oh, God, I love barbecue. <laughs> what kind I, of barbecue? Well, it's funny you say that because when you're born and raised up in the Northeast or New Jersey, if you say barbecue, that means you're going to a barbecue. I learned very quickly when I stepped foot on campus at Clemson that barbecue was way different down there than it was up here in New Jersey. And barbecue what... was pulled pork, brisket. Up here, a barbecue is burgers and dogs on, on the grill. Oh, see, I learned so, something already today. I wasn't I wasn't aware of that? the New Jersey barbecue or the Northeast barbecue. Well, that's what I was getting at because uh, here in Texas, we like brisket, right? I'm, obviously, there are other kinds of ribs and all that stuff, but Brit, Texas is known for brisket. And one of the positive things about sending out all those clips I send out on Seldom News Reserve is that I, I meet some interesting people on there. And one guy I met has a place called the Pit Boss Sauce. And he's in Greenville, by the way, your old stomping grounds. And he sent me some sauce and it was just really fantastic. I got some Salt Lake barbecue and not everybody knows about the Salt Lake, but anybody who has tried the Salt Lake 12 miles from the house, it's one of the reasons we moved to this park of town of Texas. Uh, the Salt Lake is famous for its barbecue and ribs. They have this thing called the family style and you probably call it where you're from all you can eat. And it is a beautiful thing, man. It is a beautiful thing. But anyway, I wanted to thank the guys at the Pit Boss, the Pit Boss Sauce Company. Look them up on Facebook. They sent me some sauce. Casey, yours is quote in the mail. Now we had a little setback. It'll get okay. there. He's probably can't wait. So anybody out there interested in barbecue sauce from South Carolina, I had the Carolina uh, Carolina Sweet Heat 
and it was perfect for me. I'm not a big hot sauce guy. Little little tinge, little tinge adds a little flavor to your barbecue. Good stuff. Pit Boss Sauce Company on Facebook. He's in the process of getting a full fledged website up. Help my man out. Good stuff, and he sent me some free sauce. So hey, how about that? <laughs> Definitely, we we love the plugs, and we lo I love barbecue sauce. I have, I have this sauce that I was introduced to in Florida, and I wish I looked and did a little preparation before I came on here as to where it's from. But it's called Pat's Homemade Barbecue Sauce. It's so simple. I saw it on Amazon.com one time. I bought it. It's not Pit Boss sauce, but it's still good. I love barbecue sauce. I cannot wait to taste this stuff. Cool. Good deal. Hey, I wanted to talk a little recruiting tonight. Now, I'm not the biggest recruit Nick in the world, but a couple of months ago, I started hearing all these rumblings about how great North Carolina's uh, recruiting was. And I read it online, I heard it on podcast, and I thought by the time we get to this point in the time we start uh, recording these shows, it's going to be uh, old news and, you know, not fake news, just old news. But it came up again today. I was listening to Barton and Bud's podcast, very good podcast on college football, really good information. But uh, these guys are 247 sports guys. Um, but they brought it up again, how great North Carolina's recruiting class is. So I did a little research and I found, I went back and I found, this is Danny Cannell now, another CBS guy. It's no secret Clemson football is the favorite to win the ACC. But Danny Cannell thinks Tar Heel football isn't far behind. They should make, quote, they should make the biggest jump when you consider the talent Mac Brown is bringing on campus. And that was what Danny Cannell. Now, so I did a little research. Now, I know those guys, Danny Cannell with CBS and, and Barton and Bud are 247 Sports. But I looked at, I like to look, use the rivals rankings, right? Um, just a habit and just somebody I think are, are really, really good at, at evaluating players and have been over, over years. So I thought, well, let me, let me look at this a different way. Maybe I'm missing something about North Carolina's class. Maybe I don't understand it. So I went and looked, and with the recent recruits, the recent commits to Clemson, Clemson has actually now passed North Carolina and is, is currently fourth. North Carolina is seventh. But that's the only way that they're close, right? And if you just looked at that number, and we'll get into how they get to that number in a minute, but if you just looked at that number, you'd think, yeah, North Carolina is going to compete with Clemson. They're right up there complete, competing for the same recruits. Man, all they need is one more, two more. Well, let's look at a couple of different ways. Let's look at this. Average stars, Clemson 3.86, North Carolina 3.4. Now, on first glance, you say, well, that's only, that's less than half a star, right? North Carolina's still doing really good. Well, the problem with thinking of it in that term, in those terms, is that it only goes to five stars, right? <laughs> so almost half a star is a big deal. And when you look at it mathematically, that's like the average Clemson commit right now for 2021, that's what we're talking about, is 9% better than the average North Carolina commit. So wow. when you think about that, let's say I'm 9% better than you in the 40-yard dash. I'm 9% better than you in the stock market. I'm 9% better than you, <laughs> you know, in whatever. That's a pretty good margin, right? So if I ran the, the 100 meters in uh, 11 sec, uh, let's say 10 seconds to make it easy, right? I mean, if you ran it 10 seconds, I'm going to run it in nine. That's a huge difference. Three, the difference between 3.86 and 3.4 is, is more than it sounds like when you just use the numbers. That's incredible. Yeah. I didn't even think about it that way, but that's an incredible correlation there. Yeah, 9% better in every, everything. Just think about that. If I get 9% more gas per mile, if I, you know, eventually I'm going to crush you, right? It's going to work out that way. So let's look I, at it another way. Let's look at it. If we just rank these teams by the average stars, that 3.86 to 3.4, well, instead of Clemson being fourth and North Carolina seventh, Clemson bumps up to number three. North Carolina drops down to number 12. So you're starting to see that difference, right? The difference in that 0.46 of a star. It means a lot. Let's look at it one more way. 
rivals 250 members, right? The top 250, the Nash, the guys that are ranked nationally, Clemson has 12. North Carolina has four. Hmm. Now it's getting wider. It's starting to look like this is not really even close, right? We're not even close. So I said, well, let's try and find a way that North Carolina is close. Let's look at the blue chip ratio. Now, this is, I believe, Bud Elliott, uh, Barton and Bud I was talking about. This is, as far as I know, this is his creation, right? He looks at the four and five stars. He calls those blue chips because those are the guys that typically are going to make the difference on your team. Now, sure, every once in a while, Hunter Riffer is going to show up on somebody's campus and just blow all this out the water, and all the guys on the message board are going to say stars don't matter. Over the long haul, you know, percentage-wise, stars do matter. So blue chips, four and five stars. 86% of Clemson's commits are blue chips for 2021. 40% of North Carolina's or blue chips. So you, Clemson is right. North Carolina is filling their roster basically with a few good four stars and they have some highly ranked four stars, a couple. Clemson is cramming their roster with four stars and, and above. They don't have any five stars so far this season. But the whole point here is to say, to look at the recruiting rankings. And this is not an indictment of North Carolina or even Tennessee who's up at number two right now. This is not an indictment of their recruiting class. They have improved. But to make the jump and, and say that they are competing with Clemson in recruiting is just not a true fact. And it says more about the way rivals ranks teams than it does about North Carolina's recruiting. They're giving them, I think it's between 50 and 75 points for every three-star uh, on the list up to 20, meaning that if you've got 23 stars and I've got 12 four stars, you very well might be ranked ahead of me. And it makes no sense because those three stars in the long haul aren't going to be able to compete with the higher ranked guys, especially when you've only got a third of them. So it's also a matter of trying to get clicks on your website, right? Because North Carolina competing with Clemson for ACC recruiting title causes a lot more people to click than North Carolina's recruiting is improving. I was just going to pose you that question. I was just going to say now, and I, and this is probably a one-off from what rivals is doing, but our people, Danny Cannell, for one, I think I'm in the well into the minority in saying that I actually enjoy Danny Cannell. I loved him on, Rosillo and Cannell on ESPN radio back in the day. And he loves to rough, ruffle feathers, especially those of SEC fans. So do you think it's a little bit of a ploy, too, that the ACC right now is starving for somebody to compete with Clemson? Starving for it. So finally, now, Mac Brown is a heck of a recruiter. He's surrounded himself with good coaches, good recruiting coaches. And he's actually recruiting well. They have that Drake May kid who was going to go to Alabama, and he decided, no, I'm going to – he's a quarterback, Luke May's little brother. And he's he's a blue chipper. He's a four-star kid from right around the corner. So um, they're definitely getting some players, but it felt like, it feels like, and that's what I'm going to ask you when once I stop talking here, is that what this ploy is? Is this ploy more, yes, they're recruiting well, but good Lord, we need someone to compete with Clemson. So we're just going to start this narrative now because, hey, heck, we might be right. Maybe maybe they do compete with them. They competed with them a little bit last year. Maybe this year at the ACC Championship and beyond, it's going to be North Carolina. I would say perhaps on Cannell's part, I would agree with that. Yes. Um, you know, he's an ACC guy. He likes the ACC, played in the ACC or – or I don't remember if he was at Florida State when they were in the ACC or not. But he yes. likes the ACC. He likes to poke at the SEC. So on his part, yes. But on the other guy's part, maybe Bud Elliott, he's a Florida State guy. Okay, maybe so. I don't know. But but I don't think in general it's, it's a ploy. It might be a ploy for clicks. I can certainly see that, but not a, quote, ACC ploy. I think the other thing I wanted to point out, and – Living where I live, for those of you who don't know, I live right outside of Austin, Texas. Very familiar with Mac Brown and the Texas program when he was there. Now, Mac is into his field, right? 
He's got his spiel that he's recycling from Texas. Here it was like, I'm putting a fence around the state and the mama's getting mad because I can only take 25. So you're starting to hear those same type of things in North Carolina. A couple of things here. Let me tell you about his fence around the state. <laughs> the, it's a poor fence. <laughs> the number one recruit in North Carolina is not yet committed, but many believe he's leaning towards Clemson and Clemson is their favorite for his services. Peyton Page, is that? Yes, yes, Peyton Page. The number two commit, uh, the number two ranked player in North Carolina is a Clemson commit. The number four ranked player in North Carolina is an Ohio State commit, and the number five ranked player in North Carolina is a Tennessee commit. That doesn't sound like a fence to me. That sounds like maybe a single piece of wood standing up. <laughs> Actually, and, they, and I, I, you know, to be fair to Mac, they do have like seven, eight, six, seven, and nine, or something like that in the state. So. Not quite a fence yet, Mac, but we get it. We get it. You're you're um, you're building a fence around North Carolina. This hasn't happened yet. The other thing is, what happened to Mac at Texas is that he relied on all Texas kids. I can remember my coworkers at the time saying, "We don't even need to go outside of Texas. We can just do what we want right here in Texas," and that's great. And that worked pretty darn good until Texas A&M joined the SEC. Oh, suddenly they had an option. And it wasn't just Texas A&M. LSU was getting kids from Texas. Um, uh, Arkansas gets a, a number of kids from Texas before uh, Chad Morris went there. So the point is, you can build around North Carolina. And North Carolina has a lot of talent, a lot of talent that Clemson gets. And we know Todd Gurley went to Georgia. That's great in a year when North Carolina has a lot of talent. But what about those years North Carolina doesn't have a lot of talent or has less talent? Meanwhile, Clemson is going to California, and we know Clemson is going to Florida. We know Ohio State recruits nationally, and so does Alabama. So just conquering North Carolina, that is going to be great. And you'll probably win your division. You're not likely going to be Clemson and you're probably not going to be any kind of player on a national scene with the likes of Alabama, Clemson, and Ohio State. And uh, Not to switch gears a little bit on you, but to switch gears a little bit, I, because this was a topic on our list to, to talk about tonight, I dug, I dug a little bit, kind of one-off. I took the uh, – I wanted to know how many five-stars, because I know they don't, they don't have many every year. I didn't know what the number was. I, I – I think I mistakenly had said in the past it's about 25, but I looked and there's 17 this year, 17 going for the class of 2021. Currently only six are uh, verbally committed and Ohio state has three of them, which is two defensive ends and one from Ohio right in the backyard. He, I don't think Clemson didn't even offer him and one kid from Florida. And then they have an offensive uh, guard, I believe from Texas from Houston. I don't know geography in Texas, so I'm just going to say right in your backyard. Uh, <laughs> 50 miles, but no big deal. we got right big there. backyards. <laughs> Georgia's got one from Georgia, the quarterback, Van, Van de Griff. Uh, Oklahoma's got a wide receiver. I mean, like they just fit into where they're going. Oklahoma's got a wide receiver. Washington's got Brock Heward's kid, uh, who's a five-star kid, number 14 overall. Oklahoma, again, as I say, many times and we'll probably continue to say a frisbee catching dog because they just got these tall lean lanky dudes that can run like deer and this kid mario williams out of plant city who i have seen play plant city florida is one of those just fits the ilk another big bodied strong kid who's going to run like a deer down there for lincoln riley and probably you know be like another cd lamb for for oklahoma so but it's interesting that there's only 17 five stars and there were seven commit verbally commits. Now there's only six, but I'm not a big recruit Nick either. This topic just had me into it. I like seeing it. I like when, you know, I'm a Clemson homer. So when Clemson gets a kid like Will Shipley, I, I celebrate it. When they get a kid like Barrett Carter, the linebacker from Georgia, I celebrate it. And I celebrate it a little bit more because as you said, they're going to other States and just handpicking the kids that they want. And it really feels like they're doing that. They went into California, got DJU's best wide receiver coming 2021. 
I mean, it, it's it's a wealth of riches right now. And as a Clemson fan, even though it's not Clemson centric, I'm enjoying the ride, man, thoroughly. So I'm not a recruit guy, but I'm enjoying well, it. Me neither, but I know people want to hear recruiting news, so we're going to talk about it, right? And I'm going to learn about yeah. it to some extent. Now, I may not be able to tell you this guy's going to be the next, you know, uh, T. Higgins, but I can say he's going to be good. And <laughs> – one of the things I think the one of the things I left out as you were talking, uh, I was thinking one of the things I left out is that this fence Mac is putting around the state. North Carolina currently has 15 commits. Now you and I have talked, and I've told you this, but don't act like Clemson wants those players. Out of those 15 commits that Mac is so proud of, and he has, Clemson offered four of them. Right? They only want four of them. And that's telling me that Max recruiting some good guys, some some high four stars, and the quarterback you uh, alluded to, um, very good player. Derek May, not saying he's not. I'm not saying they don't have good players. But Clemson only wanted four of their players. Out of the 15 they have committed, Clemson offered four. And this is per rivals again. So Clemson doesn't even want the vast majority of the players at North Carolina has committed to them. And that ought to tell you, that ought to speak volumes to tell you the truth. That ought to blow all the other stats out of the water. Why aren't these guys going to Clemson? Because Clemson does not want them or not are not interested in them. That speaks volumes, at least for me. It hey Beef, does. we've yes, been sir. talking about some some heavy things here in the coronavirus. Um, and all the the pandemic and all the ramifications that has for our favorite sport, college football, obviously other stuff going on in the world. A lot of heavy stuff going on right now. Tell me, do you have anything, do you have an uplifting story, something good, some positive news for us on this podcast? You know, it's funny you should ask because it is a time where you have to really dig to find positivity. Uh, especially in the world today with what we're seeing on the news. No matter what news you watch, it's not good. Uh, so a little bit of positive. I dug deep this week, and actually I went a little personal. Uh, I happened to have a birthday on uh, about six days ago from when we're recording this. Happy not birthday. to let the <laughs> – thanks. Uh, and – I'm not big on birthdays. Uh, I'm, I'm an older dude. I got married a little older. I had a son older. So I lived by myself for a lot of years. I don't do birthdays. It was kind of my way to say, you know what, I don't really need to go out. I can sit on the couch, watch a ball game, drink a beer, have a good time. Uh, or go out with friends, go to a sports bar, watch a game. I mean, it was a basically watch a game was, was what I wanted to do. I spent most of my birthdays, quite honestly, at a Clemson Regional at a baseball regional. Most of the time in Clemson, sometimes went to Athens to watch them play. So college baseball was my thing to do right around my birthday, which is June 4th. So anyway, this year I told my wife, I don't want anything special. I don't want to do anything. You know, people up here in New Jersey are doing a lot of those drive-by birthday things, which is great. It's a lot of fun. I've been involved on it from, from a driver perspective. It's been fun. It's been great, but you know, you want to get out of the car and hug somebody. Well, this year, my wife, she didn't, and Norm, she's not good with surprises. She wants, she, if she's doing something good, she wants to tell you about it. She can't hold it. She's so funny. She's this little thing. Anyway, so this year, uh, my son went to my parents. We allowed that to happen for the first time since March. And so she made me go pick up my son at four o'clock on my birthday. And I'm like, this is, you know, I'm, I'm mumbling under my breath. Anyway, long story short, I come home. Four of my best friends in the world are on the front porch. My wife's two older kids are set up the uh, cornhole boards. They're throwing cornhole. There's three coolers outside on my front yard. Chairs set up. And then we had a Zoom call with 31 of my best friends in the, around the country. I had a guy in Alaska, a guy in Oregon, uh, many in Georgia, South Carolina, all sorts of people. It was It was awesome. It was super. So it really lifted my spirits because, you know, we have been stuck in here. I, I joke about the basement, but quite honestly, that's where I am right now. I'm in the basement. And that's, this is my office. I'm an outside sales guy. And, and this has been my office as an inside salesperson for the last three months. 
So it was really nice to get out. It was a beautiful day, which doesn't normally happen for me. Usually rain, uh, extensive rain delays. And it was just a great day. So it, I, I remember it. She got a cake, a wonderful cake. I love banana pudding. That, that comes from my southern days. You got a banana pudding cake of some. It was it was ridiculous. Anyway, I'm I've started working out the day after, so I'm <laughs> I got to lose the weight. But it was a great day. It was a fantastic day. Very positive. Very uplifting. And it was exactly what I needed personally for my mind and uh, for the birthday. Hey, that's a great story. And I I was thinking as you were talking, and you said uh, uh, you got married late, and and. Uh, you were mumbling under your breath when she asked you to go pick up your son and, and voice of experience here, the longer you're married, the more you mumble, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I also, by the way, got married late and, and had a son late and my uplifting, uh, as anybody who follows me on social media knows, um, my son means the world to me and, and, um, you've got a great journey ahead of you. Um, sharing all the things that you love like sports and and with him right because and i'll get into this in another show but the my favorite trip with him last year was to corpus a road trip just me and him to see seth beer play and we actually kind of got a double header in there because later in the game zach Irwin came in to pitch against seth beer so it was it was quite the day for us and taylor motter who i'm telling the whole story now Taylor Motter, who played at Coastal and played in the majors, uh, was playing first base that day, and he he threw the ball into the stands, and Parker got it. My son Parker got the ball. So that was that was pretty cool. That wasn't actually my story. My story, my uplifting story today, is it's got to do with fatherhood. And you know, you you'll get into this as your son gets older. You'll question yourself every day. Am I a good parent? Am I doing this right? You know, he's struggling in school or whatever. And when the pandemic hit and my kid never uh, never went back to school after spring break, he really missed it. And it was kind of surprising to me. Now, he didn't miss the academic part as much as I'd hope. He missed the social part. Still a little bit of a surprise. Well, the school district decided just to give them P's for passing, I's for incomplete. That was it. They didn't fail anybody if they didn't show up on the Zoom calls. Because quite honestly, they weren't prepared. It was haphazard. It was one teacher had them every day. One teacher had them once a week. One, you know, it was all over the place, right? It was it just emergency, urgent, do what you can kind of thing. So come to the last week of school, I'm starting to get reports from teachers. This is late and he hasn't done this and I haven't talked to him and, and, and all this stuff. And I was starting to worry. So I was like reaching out to those teachers to say, Oh my goodness, is he going to get the P? Is he going to get to go to high school next year? And I was real worried and thought I was a horrible parent. And I just hadn't been following him as much, you know, paying as much attention because I'm working here too. And my wife is working. Every teacher that responded to me came back and they all said, he's a great kid. And when a teacher, because I know what I was like in eighth grade and great, I don't think anybody was telling my mom I was a great kid, right? <laughs> so when a teacher tells you your son is a great kid, it, it, the feeling is hard to describe, right? Because you're like, I was so worried and I thought I was such a horrible parent. And here's the teacher, teachers saying he's a great kid. And um, the funny thing is, is I was telling Parker this and he told me, well, dad, to be honest with you, most of the other kids don't set the bar very high. <laughs> so um, he even had some self-deprecating humor in there. And it was just a, a feeling of validation, which I really needed. Um, because you're not getting a lot of that from work in this remote environment. At least I'm not. But it even gets better. I found out later that he sat down and emailed every teacher and told them what he liked about their class on his own. I didn't tell him to do this folks on his own. He emailed the teachers and said, I really enjoyed this or that or whatever it was about their class that he enjoyed. So I looked at my wife and I just said, we're doing something right. We don't know what it is. <laughs> we do not have a clue what it is, but we're just being ourselves. And we're That's doing fantastic. Right. So that is, I, I, 
I've been told that there, I think there's nothing better to be told by others that your kid is a great kid. Yeah. And I try to tell my friends who have great kids that they have great kids just to make sure that they know that they they're doing a great job. Yeah, they need to know to mean the world to them. I, the other the other thing to happen, this was some months ago, his winter, he has two basketball seasons. Well, this year he's only going to have one. But his basketball coach, I said, you know, he's really grown. He had the same coach three or four years. He's really grown. Thank you for being patient with him. He learns from you. And he just looked at me and he said, he's never given me one problem. He comes here to practice every day. He works his butt off and he cares about what he's doing. I was like, holy crap. What the he's hell here. am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> Don't know what I'm doing, but something's happening. Something, he's doing something right. So That's fantastic. That's my, and one thing we want to make sure that we tell everybody too is that we are going to bring personal stories into this. We're kind of not necessarily not going to get the whole kit and caboodle, but we are going to we are going to bring our families on. Heck, Marty, you're going to bring Parker on up for yeah. a couple episodes. I hope he is okay. our what we're calling our historian because at 13 years old, I think he's got more history lessons for us in the sports world than anybody else that I've ever talked to. Well, the funny thing is, is I I was, I was telling Brandon, Brandon Rake, my friend at TigerNet, I was telling him I was going to be doing this with you because the solo podcast wasn't working and I didn't want to take all Brandon's time away from TigerNet. And I said, or me and Parker can talk about, you know, 19th century baseball players because he knows them all. And the, the funniest thing he told me, he, the first thing he wants to talk about on this podcast is, the 2007 college football season, how crazy it is. And I was thinking, I was telling Beef, I was saying, how crazy is it? You were one year old when it happened, and he knows about it, and he wants to talk about it on the podcast. So it's just fantastic. I'm looking forward to that. I truly, yeah. truly am. I haven't met him yet. I can't wait to, and uh, especially to bounce some uh, knowledge off of him. That's going to be a great day. But one thing I noticed, too, while doing this, we're doing this on Zoom here, behind you, Marty, you have our our uh, listener, I think it says that. Listeners and viewers. Listeners and viewers. Because we have a video. Of this. That's fantastic. And the other is, is an in, it says interesting jar? Yeah, that's a relic of uh, Brandon Rink, too, on the podcast. I, what I found myself doing with Brandon, and, I, and I'll have to go back and listen to this when I edit it out to see if I've said that word that I won't say right now, because... <laughs> I always used that word when I was, you know, stalling for time, right? Some people say, um, and, uh, and I do plenty of that too. But, uh, one word that I always say was, and I'll say it and I'll put a dollar in a jar was interesting, right? Um, you could say, Hey, Marty, um, I forgot to flush the toilet and I'd say interesting, right? So I'm wasting time trying to think of something to say. And I didn't want to do that on this, uh, podcast and shows so I thought every time I say interesting that's twice now <laughs> I'm going to put a dollar in the jar and Ooh. at the end of the year I'm going to uh, donate that to some charity we'll we'll figure it out and you and I and Zach Locks folks are going to have a little contest on picks and we're going to donate those proceeds to uh, a charity of the winner's choice at the end of the season so just a little something to try and stop me from saying that word so often and using it as a crutch and also to, to give something to some charity. We'll figure and out. And one, one thing that I say on the Chop and Beef show that I, I do as well with Zach Locks Parker, my, my prog celebrity prognosticator minus the celebrity part, is I always say it's, it'll be interesting to see and I notice national guys doing it too. Not I'm nowhere near a national guy, but National guys do it too, and it, it's now become a distractor in my head. And it, it, but it's a stall. It's another stall thing for me too, because you know you have to come up with something to say because there's dead air. Oh, it'll yeah. be interesting to see whether or not. So, I may donate m money myself if I do that. Well, so. I've already got two dollars that'll be in the jar when we do this next week, and uh, I think we've had a, a good first run at it, Beef. I appreciate your time, man. Yeah. Uh, close it up for us with any closing thoughts you may have. Man, I'm really looking forward to to doing this show moving forward. Of course, we we may stumble through this first episode here, but thankfully to the uh, to to the world of editing, we may have a chance to clean it up a little bit. 
But I think this is going to be a great thing, especially as the news starts coming in and as teams and players start coming into the fold. Hopefully we can get, move away from the COVID-19 thing, even though that's probably going to be lingering until at least there's a treatment for it and more into the actual play. Uh, I can't wait for it. I'm really looking forward to it. Sluggo, the podcast is going to be fantastic. Everyone should listen to it and uh, maybe view it if they want to look at our wonderful faces. Well, our faces are a drawback, but uh, we promise to uh, get better each show, provide in-depth information. Uh, as Beef said earlier, not only on the Tigers, but uh, all around college football. So uh, this is going to be about more than Clemson. So we hope you join. Ask questions if you have anything. If you have any questions, slugopod at gmail.com. Put it in the comments of Facebook. We've got Facebook, YouTube, et cetera, et cetera. I'll get all that information out to you. We will have guests. Beef and I are starting this off right now. I mean, it's June, so, you know, uh, we, we aren't going to be the only two on here. Parker, my son, will be on, as we just talked about. Zach Locks, Parker will be on here. We have commitments from multiple folks across the spectrum of college football. Brandon Rink at TigerNet has agreed to be on. Dan Hope, who used to work with Brandon over at Orange and White, but now works for 11 Warriors, Ohio State guy, going to come in and talk to us. Also got Edward Egras. Edward is a Fox Sports Southwest uh, TV announcer, but he's also an analyst guy. And he's a guy you want to talk to if you like to put money on things like who's going to win the Heisman or the national championship. He's got crazy outlandish things. I talked to him last year, and he was telling me about this quarterback uh, for Houston, <laughs> Tiaret King, who I think played like a half and then said, ah, catch you next year <laughs> at another school, by the way. Uh, but he thought Tiaret King was going to have a chance at the Heisman. You know, that's what – and, and I'll get into this whatever, but it was a value. And I was like, you know what I call a value? I call that – you call that a value. I call it throwing your money away. But anyway, <laughs> that's my take. So it's not even just going to be the two of us moving forward. We'll have guests. We've got guys committed to actually talk football when we get to that point of the preseason. And former players as well. We got former players. We got former Clemson players. I got even a possible player going into college, maybe a Patriot League player. Some we're gonna we're gonna run the gamut here. We may not pick Patriot League games, but we may have some Patriot League players, maybe some JUCO players as well that I know. We're going to dig into our network and try to get some as many interesting and fun people that we can get on the show to interview and talk about the world of college football, which is both a passion of mine and I believe it's a passion of Marty's as well. So we're really looking forward to this thing, looking forward to be very interactive. We definitely want your interactivity uh, on all of the social medias. Marty did a great job putting it on Facebook and uh, thanks to Seldom Use Reserve Network as well for, for letting us be on there as well. Uh, it's, it's going to be fun. It's going to be very fun. And I can't wait to get going, going. Absolutely going to be fun. The closer we get to August and September, the more straight football talk we have. And I can't wait. Casey, thank you for your time tonight. And thank you. We'll Let's talk to take you it out. Producer Amy, how'd we do tonight? I think that sounds pretty good.